Well, here we are in the fourth week of our message series, a series that we are calling Me, Myself, and Us. And a big part of the motivation for this series has been the reality we've all been dealing with, we've all been living through, we've all been experiencing over the last while, the reality that this social distancing and physical separation that is truly needed to protect some of us at least from serious illness, that this has challenged us in other ways. In the first week, we talked about how those challenges have helped us to realize not only that this is not how we want to live our lives, but also something more, that this is not how we are meant to live our lives. By also looking at a story from the early church, we discover the surprising truth that God desires to deepen his relationship with us in and through our relationships with one another. And we realize that if this is true, and it is, our everyday life is something in which God is directly involved. And that in a certain way, he is depending on us, on me and you. In week two, we looked at how even though our own experiences, experience teaches us that we're made for relationship, and even though we might believe that God is trying to work in us and through us in those relationships, very often in our lives, we still have commitment issues. We hesitate, we draw back, from paying the price that will allow us to enter into deeper, life-giving relationships with each other, and for that matter, with God. We recognize that one of the reasons for that is that meaningful relationship comes at a cost, and a big part of that cost is time. It takes time to come to know someone well enough to recognize their gifts. And time, perhaps not quite so much at this moment, but let's assume we're not living through a permanent state of affairs here. Time is something that seems to us to be in short supply. So we consider the busyness that is so much a part of our experience and its effect on our ability to create and nurture life-giving relationships in our life. We remembered how we try in ordinary times at least to compensate for that, how we use date planners and calendars and scheduling to arrange our our days and nights so that we can accomplish or at least come close to accomplishing everything that we hope to accomplish. We try, but in the end, even success in time management doesn't always feel like success. And so we took a step back, a step back from busyness and from specific strategies to manage our busyness. And we returned to the story of creation. We considered a God-given, or if you prefer, a natural boundary that can structure our time and our life, night and day. A boundary that is not much respected in our current world. And last week we explored the idea, an idea that also comes to us from the story of creation, the idea of a day given over to rest. And for we Christians also to offer praise and thanksgiving to our creator, we explored the idea of a Sabbath. Once again, we recognize that whether or not we are Christian, our own life and even our own body teaches us the importance of respecting the need that we have for space in our life, a space that's not given over to constant activity and to productivity, but rather a space that allows us to rest and to grow in fruitful, life-giving relationships. We recognize that doing that, growing in relationship with God and with one another, brings us the gift of peace, the peace of being or at least becoming the person we were created to be. And we noted that God wants to give that gift of peace to us, but that he also asks us to share it with others. Today, we're going to look at something that is necessary in order for us to truly receive that gift of peace and to share it. It's something connected to this feast day that we're celebrating today. What we need in order to do that isn't some kind of moral strength. It's not that God is good and we need to try to be good so that we can receive peace. Although God is good and we do need to try to be good. It's something that we might say, philosophically at least, that comes even before that. It's about who God is. And if we believe that he exists and that he created us, it's also about who he created us to be. Becoming who we were created to be, achieving the joyful, fulfilling life we've been talking about and that we're all looking for, doesn't just happen. It takes work. It takes intentional choices. But the nice part is that God, who is, after all, nothing if not a giver, 
God is ready to help us to get where we need to go. And in fact, he's already helping us. Helping us in part, as we talked about in previous weeks, by reaching out to us through the words of the human authors of scripture, of the Bible, and in and through those words, revealing to us a mystery. Now, the particular mystery we are encountering today, as we've already heard, is the mystery of the Trinity. The mystery that God makes himself known to us both and at the same time as one, but also as three. I said a couple of weeks ago that mystery, a mystery in our sense, is a reality, a truth that is bigger than we are. And no matter how much we learn about it, there is even more that we do not yet know, still to be discovered. One of the beautiful things about this Sunday, Trinity Sunday, is that it teaches us about both of those mysteries which we have spoken. The mystery of God and the mystery that is me and you. First, of course, it teaches us about God. In the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, we encounter God as one. So we can say with the people of Israel as Christians, we can say with our elder brothers and sisters in faith, as the church calls them, we can say with Israel that God is one. And yet, we Christians also say something more. We say that those who followed, journeyed, and shared life with Jesus, Peter and John, Andrew, James, Mary Magdalene, the disciples, those who shared life with him, those who witnessed his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, knew him to be who he claimed to be. They experienced that, the Son of God the Father, and they believed him when he told them, as he tells us, the Father and I are one. And then also, in their experience of the Holy Spirit, which we remembered last week, as we celebrated Pentecost, in their experience of the Holy Spirit, they realized that they were again encountering God, the Father, the Son, but something more. Something more and yet still one. And so like the experience of the early Christians recorded in scripture, Trinity Sunday, this celebration, teaches us about God. But it also teaches us about us, about the mystery of the human person. And that is because it teaches us about relationship. In the language of the church, the way we talk about these things, one of the ways that we do attempt to talk about the mysterious God, this mysterious God who is, who is so much bigger than we can possibly comprehend, this God who is both and at the same time one and three, one of the ways we talk about that is by saying that our God is a community of persons. In fact, the very word person, which for you and me so naturally speaks of us, individual human beings, the very word person actually entered our language through Christian theology as one of the ways of trying to distinguish, to talk about what's going on inside the Trinity, the persons of the Trinity. That's the origin of the term. So then we can say with some confidence that God is defined by relationship, or rather because God is too big to be confined within a particular definition, God is relationship. Father, Son, and Spirit in constant, dynamic, living relationship with each other. That is God. And so then, being made in the image of God, made like Him, so are you and I. So then, if I ask you who you are, if I ask you that question and you tell me who you are, but you leave out the major relationships, the human relationships that are part of your life, you're not really telling me the whole story about yourself. Like God, you and I are also our relationships. We can't really deny that. We all have relationships. There are in our lives relationships of blood, relationships that we acknowledge. Every time we look at a new baby or a growing child and see in that child the face of a mother, father, maybe even a grandparent. We never question that those relationships help make us who we are, that we carry them with us as we go out into the world. But it only takes a moment's reflection to realize that there are many other relationships that we also carry with us, relationships that are part of who we are, that make us who we are, part of how we understand ourselves and our world, 
part of how we look at others. Sometimes we look at others through the eyes of one of those people in our earlier relationships. And how we experience others looking at us. Relationships do that. And not just relationships defined by inheritance or genetics. Also, our encounters with others in the course of our life. We can all, each of us, point to people, friends, mentors, role models, for many of us teachers, who have had a profound influence on who we are today. We carry them with us. They are part of who we are. Like it or not, that is true. And impactful relationships, relationships are not just part of our past. In truth, the relationships that you and I are in today will have a huge impact on who we're going to be tomorrow. We can't avoid it. Now, we can avoid relationships, and many try. We can turn in on ourselves. We can sort of skate on the surface of any conversations of which we're a part. We can be polite to people, but not always maybe just a little bit too busy to engage with them. We can skate through our days without connecting with people. But even if we do that, we will still become like our relationships. That only means that we will become like those relationships, superficial, shallow, self-involved, and self-protective. So if we have any ambition towards goodness, relationships are not an option. Serious relationships are not an option. They are a necessity. Because if we are alive, we are growing, and we grow in relationships healthy, life-giving relationship with God and with one another, these things nourish us. They help us to live and to grow. So what do we do? Well, first we do what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks. Most of us, after all, still need to work to make more room in our life for relationships, to, make, to create time, shared time. And time, as we know, is precious. We need to be rethinking how we live in relation to the natural, God-given boundary of night and day, and doing our best to make room in our week for a Sabbath, space that will help us to get ready to grow in our relationships. Now, I'm not going to claim that that, in this society, in this place at this time, I'm not going to claim that that is easy. And neither is the rest of the job. Because time isn't the only cost to relationships. Another cost, and this might surprise you, is that we need to acknowledge our limitations. We're not really big on that in our society. We need to acknowledge our limitations. Because the truth is, whatever our hopes and dreams for our future, each of us is a particular person living in a particular place at a particular time. And the truth is that relationships and the nourishment that relationships can give us exist not really in some far off future necessarily, but really they're likely close at hand. Chances are that most of the potential for growth and nourishment in relationship is already nearby. It is in our existing relationships, our relationships with our parents, our children, siblings, friends, even grandparents. In these relationships, and I want also to emphasize, in the relationships that we share in this community, it's here that we find our nourishment and our growth. And the relationships in this community are important because relationship with God and with others is what this community, what we are all about. And ultimately, the deepest, most life-giving human relationships are like that. They are the ones where those involved also share a relationship with the one who made them, the one who loves them, and the one who sustains them on their journey through this life. Because however hard we work with our purely, purely human gifts and talents and energy, no matter how hard we work, be it in marriage, friendship, or community, you and I cannot create complete unity. You and I cannot manufacture, by our own will and strength, communion. We cannot create what we were created to desire. Unity and communion come at a cost. The cost of giving yourself away. The cost of handing over part of yourself, something precious, into the hands of someone else. 
And that feels very often dangerous. Because you and I, on our own, are not really worthy of receiving such a precious gift. And for that same reason, because we know who we are, we also do not easily find the courage to hand over that precious part of ourselves to someone else, someone like us. It's crazy. Well, almost crazy. But we believe, this community believes, that fruitful, life-giving, and even lifelong relationships are saved from craziness by a simple truth, that we can trust, that we can find unity and communion, the unity and communion that we seek if we make our Creator, if we make God part of the equation. And that is a great example of something that one spiritual writer has called God's math. Some of us are old enough to remember the new math, now we have God's math. Because when it comes to God, as we were remembering on this Trinity Sunday, one plus one plus one, contrary to what you can see on the screen before you, does not equal three. In God's math, one plus one plus one equals one. And so it is, or can be, with us in our relationships. The creation story from the Bible that we've been quoting from for the past few weeks makes the same point about us after it relates the creation of man and woman. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. So then, in the Trinity, one plus one plus one equals one. And in our relationships also, one plus one also equals one. God's math. God is big on relationship, but it's a special kind of relationship. It's a relationship that is like his, that's like him. A relationship where we can find the connection, find the communion that we desire, but without losing ourselves. That's the kind of relationship we were all, every one of us, made for. It is the kind of relationship that we desire in our hearts. And marriage isn't the only place where we can find it. That is why there is a long and time-honored tradition in Christianity, going right back to the Bible, of honoring friendship. So, a beautiful vis vision, I hope at least, has been set before you, but how do we get there? Are we on our own? Are we created to, des to desire something that we can never achieve? Well, as I've already suggested, no, because God is already involved in a relationship, in our relationships. Think back to that first week. It's not a condition of being an active, practicing Catholic for God to be involved in your life and your relationship. God is already there. God is already depending on us in those relationships, on you and on me. And so the promises that we make to each other in those relationships, we do that formally in the case of relationships such as marriage and informally in the case of relationships of friendship and community. Those promises we also make to God. But at the same time, he promises to be faithful to us and to help us make one plus one equal one. To be able to trust enough to give that precious part of ourself away. And with that, finally comes peace. As St. Paul wrote to the early church, and we heard it proclaimed today, brothers and sisters, listen to my appeal. Agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord is just waiting to pour his gifts into your life and your relationships, but he can't be the only one who is given. Next week in our last message in this series, we'll look at the tradition of Christian friendship and how we can deepen our relationships with each other by tapping into the life-changing power of what Jesus did to deepen our relationship with him, something that we can do each and every Sunday. So, I have along the way been giving you 
what I'm calling homework. And we're going to do that once again. I have four questions that I'd like you to consider. Maybe it's one of them, maybe it's all of them. I'm just going to share them with you now. First, describe to yourself or perhaps in conversation with a friend or family member, a relationship from your past that you still carry with you. How has that relationship made you who you are? If you're courageous and if you trust the person with whom you're speaking, you might even choose a negative relationship here. Second, what do you think are the greatest barriers to deeper individual relationships and community in our society? What are the barriers to those things? And do any of them affect you? Are they part of your experience in your life? Third, what people, and this is a little bit like the first one, what people have taught you the most, for better or worse, about how to engage in relationships? Who do you look to if you want to look for someone who knows how to live a fruitful and life-giving relationship? Who would that be? Or more than one. Fourth, are there ways in which you might be substituting achievement or activity for connecting in your life? What might those ways be that you in your life are substituting achievement or activity for connection and relationship? Spend a little bit of time with those questions so that you can, in a deeper way than I'm able to do, see in your heart the ways in which this issue of relationship and growing in relationship and depth of relationship is part of your journey through life. And rest assured that through this week, I'll be praying for you that the Lord, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit might give you the gift of wisdom and insight to allow you to understand the mystery that is you a little bit more deeply and grow in your life, in your love, and in all of your relationships.